Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ridge Chapel. We're glad you came here to worship with us this morning. We hope you're blessed by the time that we have together. Don't forget to stay for potluck. Everybody hear that? <laughs> All right, I do have a couple other announcements that I want to make mention of, too. Sally has told me that there would not be a ladies' meeting, ladies' Bible study this month. Is that right, Sally? She's busy. <laughs> She's handing out, by the way, if you want any uh, advertisements for VBS, Sally's got a bunch of them there. But she did say that she wouldn't be able to have the uh, ladies' meeting this month. We are having the men's meeting this coming Saturday. And also, Monday night is the uh, normal uh, meeting, leadership meeting, 7 o'clock tomorrow night. There are calendar cards back there on the table. If you haven't picked one of those up and don't know for sure what's going on this month, you can pick one of those up and have that. This, uh, the missions for this month is our local FCA, and I just put a video on there. If you're not familiar with Fellowship of Christian Athletes, there's a video on Facebook that really gives a good description of who they are, what they are, what they do. So uh, take a look at that if you get a chance. And then the other one is Eden Ministries, which will be our VBS mission this, uh, this time. And we're uh, actually raising funds for their educational program in order to get materials that they're using for school. I got these all out of order, so I want to make sure that I have everything. One more. Marion and Hank were given a bunch of blueberries, and they're in the freezer, and they say, take a bag. So first come, first served <laughs> from the freezer. All right, that's all I have. Let's stand together. Whoop, wait, well, still cookies. Okay, we still need cookies for VBS. But you got a little time. That's the 22nd of the first night. Let's read the call to worship together. It comes from Deuteronomy 7.9. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commandments. Amen. Let's sing together, step by step. Oh God, you are my God. you made that a commitment as you were singing that this morning. Let's be seated. As we prepare for communion this morning, I want to make sure you have your emblems. They're still back there in the back if you haven't already picked those up so that you might be able to participate during the meditation time this morning. This is one of those songs we learned on Wednesday night. We've sung it here before, but let's try it again. The Lord Almighty reign. There's an end to song to be sung with the voice of every tribe, the sound of every tongue. When the bride of Christ on that day of days brings the joy unto the land, a multitude of praise. And like the roar of mighty seas and rolls of thunder, hear his people sing. Hallelujah.
tell with great rejoicing all the wonders God has done. Like the roar of mighty sea, rolls of thunder, all the church will sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, for the Lord. Good morning. Uh, so some of you may have known and others may not, but I was at a, a youth conference this week with a group of four teens. And we had a really great week. And the scripture there was actually from Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. And it was about walking with Jesus. It actually was rest in Jesus was the theme. Um, and the rest of your life was specifically. But the, the focus was on resting in Jesus. And of course this scripture, many, we probably all have heard it. But it reads, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We come at this time to remember Jesus, what he did for us, but also what he does for us. He's, he saved us, but he's walking beside us, if we remember that. But things in this, I actually went to McLaren's commentary and kind of dug in a little deeper with this. And they noted that the burdens of, of our sin and our daily lives really weigh us down. I mean, today we're in, in a time where the suicide rate among youth and adults is the highest it's been in recorded history. Why? Because our burdens are heavy. And if we don't have Jesus, what hope do we have? Right? Jesus says, my yoke is easy. And it's true. We have, you know, he relieves us of that sorrow of our sin. From our sin, I guess is a better way of saying that. And he invites us to come to him with all those burdens, with all that sorrow, and give it to him. You know, one of the, thing, one of the things, the first things they told the kids this week 
was talking about pausing. And I think we as adults and, and teens too need to really think about that because how busy are we, right? And you know, it's, we're so busy with so many things that really, they seem important, but they're really not, are they? <laughs> some of them. Now some of them are important, I'm not saying they're not, but some of them are like, oh, we spend so much time trying to fix things and trying to avoid this burden when what we really need to do is come to him and lay it upon him and then take up his yoke. This is, we don't, we're not without a responsibility here, people, right? We, at this time, this is part of our responsibility and it's this idea of taking up the yoke, putting it on our shoulders, but who's with us? Who's beside us? I'd never really thought, pictured this in my mind. It's Jesus. And that, I mean, fix that in your mind if you can. Jesus is right here. The yoke is on us. Yeah, we have to bear some of the load. But with Jesus there, the all-powerful, almighty Lord beside us, we can do all things through him who strengthens us, right? This is what... This is also what we're coming here to remember. Jesus is with us. Jesus loves us so deeply. He takes all of it, but does ask that we walk with him each day in this coming week, this coming month. So let's pause now and remember him and his love for us and his power that we have through him. Re taking the bread and remembering his life on this earth. Taking this cup and remember the blood that purifies us in his sacrifice. So let's go to him in thankfulness and praise. Oh, gracious Father, we do give you glory and praise for you are here with us. You walk with us, you guide us, and you've taken our burdens, the greatest burdens of all of our sin, and freed us from that yoke. But we need to walk with you, bearing the burden of spreading the news spreading that you are real, that you love us, and that you are always ready to help us. And finally, the hope that we have in the final day when you come and take us up with you again. In your son's name, amen. All right, let's stand and sing together. Young people, you'll have to wait till we're done singing. Oh, we don't have to stand, sorry. <laughs> you can sit down. <laughs> Change things up a little bit. Wait, yep, I guess. Uh, we will glorify with our lives. We we'll glorify the King of Kings. Let's do that together. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty, we will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness, we will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, he is Lord of all who Lord of the universe, all praise to him we give. Alleluia to the King of Kings, Alleluia to the Lamb, Alleluia to the Lord of Lords, who is the
Good morning. It's good to be back. It's been a week. It's good to see you, Melvin. All right, wow. It is even the right speaker this week. <laughs> Somebody told me I had money this week to go ahead and buy a vowel if it, if it showed up. I was like, I don't even know how much a vowel is. <laughs> All right, what would be worse than this? You ever woken up in the morning upset at the world and don't know why? You have no idea why, you just have this feeling on you, you're just upset. You know, things happen in the night, I'm convinced. Things go wrong in the night. Something affects us in our subconscious that something has happened. Have you guys ever been faced with the, the realization that your marriage is now on the rocks because of something you did in her dream? <laughs> I'm telling you, something goes wrong in the night. Have you ladies, have you ladies ever been tried and found guilty of throwing something away or moving something, in essence, put it away, and you have no recollection of it? Can I get an oh yeah? <laughs> Not as loud and fun as it. You know, we have so many things that happen in life that we think, can it get any worse? Can it get any worse than this? Now, sometimes it's something minor that can become an instant mountain in the moment. But then sometimes it is, in reality, an enormous mountain. It is a large obstacle that we have to cross. It, loss in our lives. Loss, we don't deal well with loss, do we? Even as minor as losing your keys or losing a knife, we have a knife that it's been lost multiple times, and it's Jessica's favorite paring knife. And we don't, I mean, we got ready to sell the van. The boys cleaned it out. Corbin says, I found the knife. <laughs> said, what was it doing in the van? And then she remembered. We found it in the van. We, we enjoyed that knife for, I don't know, a couple months. And now it's gone missing. <laughs> so if you find <laughs> loss. Loss of any number of things affect us. Jobs. A loss of a job. It's a monumental. A loss of a relationship. A loss of dear people in our lives, whether it be a spouse, a mother, father, aunt, uncle, friend. Loss can cause us to sputter and cry out, sometimes to God and sometimes to each other. We cry out because we don't understand what just... Just what could be worse than this? Our text today is found in John chapter 5. It's a day in the life of our Lord as he's journeying back into Jerusalem in, for a feast. <clears throat> it could have been the Passover that he was returning for or any other major feast. We're not sure exactly what feast it was. But as he enters Jerusalem in John 5... He happens to stroll by the sheep gate, which is the entrance to the city where the, the sheep and the oxen were brought in for the sacrifices at the temple. Thus, that entrance was probably in proximity to the temple. Near this gate, there was a, a community pool, if you will, more commonly used for washing for an individual to be ceremonially clean, but apparently on this particular day, it was taken on a medicinal role. Five porches surrounded this pool. Let's get that picture in our mind. It was a large pool, had five porches that had been turned into essentially five waiting rooms for the ill. The scripture tells us that it was a multitude of the sick, the blind, the lame, and the withered that were waiting for the water to be stirred. An agitation of the water that happened there that the Jews attributed to the angels, and they had a tendency to attribute everything to the angels that they didn't understand. 
It was a first come, first serve healing of whatever the affliction at that pool. Now, our main character today was a man who had been in his condition for 38 years. 38 years. How many of y'all are, is anybody here that's 38 years old? Every bit of it. Huh? I remember being 38. That's been a long, it was a long time. I remember as a young person, 38 seemed like an eternity. But 38 years in a condition to where he couldn't function. He was lying there at this pool. He was watching attentively, he was staring at the water, if you will, for the stirring to happen so that he would know when to start, start moving. Now, apparently, as Jesus saw him lying there and he, he begins addressing him and, and the man's response, apparently this, this lameness, this, this ill uh, condition that was happening in his life involved him not being able to walk because he tells Jesus that the problem that was facing him today, the biggest problem in his life, was his inability to get into the water quickly enough. Someone would cut him off. Someone would prevent him from getting in. And, and it, remember, it's first come, first serve, so you had to be the first one in to get the healing. He couldn't crouch at the edge to jump, apparently. He, couldn't, he wasn't strong enough to push his way to the front of the crowd. He needed help for his healing. Now, Jesus, in our text, it says that, that he knew in verse number 6 that, that this man had already been a long time in his condition. And so he asks this man a question. And it's an interesting question. Do you wish to get well? Well, automatically we would think, well, obviously he does, right? Because he's at this pool where the, the healing is supposed to happen. And so it's obviously would be his desire to get well. But, you know, Jesus has a tendency and the Lord has a tendency to ask us questions to make us stop and remember why it is that we're doing what we're doing. And so he asked this, this man is lying there in this condition. And he asked him, he says, do you want or do you wish to get well? Now, if you break that down and you look at the tense in the Greek of this wording, wish, it bears more of the idea of do you intend to get well? Are you here with the intention of getting well, or are you just hoping that it happens and you're just watching the activities? It's more of a direct approach, I believe, as you, le as you look at this, this word in the, in the construction of this request. Do you intend to get well? Well, I'm here, he says. I'm at the water. I intend to be healed, but roadblocks have been placed in my way in the form of other people. In verse 8, then Jesus responds to that, and he doesn't, doesn't argue with him, doesn't tell him that it's not an angel. It doesn't, it doesn't tell us anything about what's happening at the pool. He just simply addresses the man and the condition that he's in, and he says to him in verse 8, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Verse 9 tells us at once the man was cured, and he picked up his mat, and he walked. Now, as you follow the, the text on through, there was, there was some conversation amongst this man that has been healed and the Jews that were around because he was doing something horrible. He was carrying his bed on Sabbath. Never mind the fact that this dude had been laying there for 38 years. Never mind the fact that all of a sudden, you know, they've witnessed this magic, this, this enormous miracle that, that has happened in front of their eyes, and, and they, uh, they're more interested in, hey, you can't carry your bed today. Maybe come back tomorrow and get it. But he said, the guy, that, the guy that healed me, he told me to carry it. Well, who was it, he says. They ask him, and he says, I don't know, because Jesus disappeared into the crowd. Verse 14 tells us that later, Jesus found the man again at the temple. And he said to him, see, you are well again. You had been well once, and apparently something had happened to bring on the condition. Now he had been healed. You are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. 
what would be worse than being ill or lame for 38 years? The length of his condition in that day and age was already pushing the life expectancy. 38 years he had been ill. And now Jesus is telling him to be on guard, stop sinning or something worse can happen. Man, you know, he's at the, a happy point in his life. I imagine he wants to go out and party and have a good time because now all of a sudden he's functional where he wasn't earlier that day. Sure, all of these things were going through his mind as he thought about his condition that was and, they, and is now. And now here's the words from Jesus, the man who has healed him. To be on his guard, stop sinning, or something worse may happen. Before we look at Jesus' warning to him, I want us to take note of something. Where did Jesus find the man later? Did you catch that in the story? Found him in the temple. Found him in the temple. So he was at the pool of Bethesda, which... Could have been in the proximity of the temple. But he left there, took his bed. No doubt he probably took it home or dropped it alongside the road and come back and get his bedroll later. I don't know. But in anyway, his intention was to go to the house of the Lord, the temple. And at the temple, Jesus encounters him again. Think about that. For 38 years, this man had been deprived of the ability to go to worship. For 38 years, he had been deprived of the ability to make offerings, to present himself to the Lord. Jesus has now given back to the man what he hadn't been able to enjoy for 38 years. Wouldn't it be natural for the response to be a response of praise? A giving back to the Lord and a thanksgiving Notice the words of the psalmist following a time of distress and a time of answered prayer in Psalm 66. I've got it here in my text. I'll read it to you. You can turn there, write it down, read it later. I don't care. Psalm 66, 13 through 20. Notice what the psalmist says. I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you, vows that my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. Can you imagine what conversations have been happening for 38 years between this man and God? If you will just heal me, maybe that's why. And I wondered, when I read this text, and I saw there in verse 3 of our text in John 5, it says that they lay in these porches, lay a multitude of those who were sick. I was like, why would Jesus just focus in on this one man that was lying there? When there were multitudes there, why didn't he just heal them all? Perhaps it was because of conversations that this man was having with God himself. His prayers. The psalmist says, I'm going to come with burnt offerings and fulfill the vows that I've made to you. Vows that I promised. My mouth spoke when I was in trouble. I will sacrifice fat animals to you and an offering of rams. I will offer bulls and goats. Come, come and listen, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. My praise was on my, his praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened. And he heard my voice in prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. Thus we see the appropriate responses of praise and proclamation. When God offers deliverance. Let's remember that. When God answers our prayers. Now whether the affliction that our man in our text endured was a result of a sinful action or not, we aren't told specifically that. But the truth of the matter is that when we are blessed with the ease of misery in our life, Whether sin caused or not, we are faced with the danger of returning to sin. What do I mean by that? Maybe not active sin, but we are faced with the danger of becoming focused on other things than our Savior. 
we tend to forget how terrible those times were and we begin to enjoy the life that we have. And thus, the voice of providence comes, go, and sin no more. To remember, to remember that without Jesus, we have no hope. Apparently, in this condition, this man, Jesus saw it necessary to give a caution to him because, again, it's common for when people, when we're sick, to promise much. When we're newly recovered, we perform only something, and then after a while, we tend to forget everything. And Christ spoke here of a a seriousness of the matter to remind this man that the rest of his life was ahead of him. And he spoke of the wrath to come, which is beyond compare, worse than the many hours, indeed the weeks and the years of pain some wicked men have to suffer in consequence of their unlawful indulgences. And if such afflictions are severe, how dreadful will be the everlasting punishment of the wicked. In Luke chapter 5, and verse number 31, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. As we begin to look at this, this idea of this warning that Jesus gives this man, you have become well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse may befall you. And then I reflect us on Jesus' mission to come to call sinners to repentance. Not worried about those who are in a good relationship with God per se, but to remind all of us that there is a requirement. The brother pointed out the responsibilities that we have in all of this. When Jesus says, I have come to call the righteous, or not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, notice that Jesus does not say that he came to call sinners to himself. Yes, that may be the end result. Because in another place, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself, signifying the manner of death that he would die for us. That was the offering of redemption. But in Luke 24, verses 45 through 47, as he's talking to his disciples there, and he's ultimately given them the Great Commission, he opened their minds so that they would understand the Scriptures, and he told them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and will rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Remember what, the, what Jesus told this man. Behold, you become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse may befall you. You see, the offer of salvation, the healing, the cleansing, and the life to come has never come to man without the condition of repentance. Yet many are promoting Jesus to be the answer without repentance. Jesus is good. Do we agree with that statement? Jesus is absolutely good, and Jesus brings good into our lives. Do we agree with that? And we want the good. Do we believe that? We want the goods, but many times we as humans are reluctant to make the hard moves that it takes to come to Jesus. The purging of sin in our lives, the habitual acts against God, the lifestyles that we enjoy, those are hard to break at times when they're in violation of the will of God. Remember what Jesus has said. You're well now, but don't sin anymore so that nothing worse will happen. Repentance is a turning away from sin and a turning to God. 
It's not just enough to turn away from sin. We have got to make that full circle and come back to God, that relationship with God. Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 2 and verse number 4 that it's the kindness or the goodness of God that leads us unto repentance. Because God is offering such good to us through Jesus Christ, that should motivate us to want to give up sin. Amen? He's good. And he loves us. But brothers and sisters, remember this morning, he's still God. He is still God. The holiness of God is still separate from sin. It hasn't changed Jesus appeased the wrath of God in his body on the cross so that we as Christians might become the righteousness of God in him, so that we would be restored back to that relationship with God that we were created for, separate from the control of sin. It was never God's will for us to be controlled by Satan and sin. Thus, the message of the gospel is to be obeyed. Not only in baptism, but in repentance from sin. Jesus says, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Anybody a visual learner? Well, I hope uh, maybe we can learn from this. We have a lot of spokes. We have a lot of uh, areas in our life. You see it? And so I identified 12 different areas. <clears throat> Sports for you young guys. You could put exercise. Anybody exercise in here? There's a few of you. <laughs> Not very many. But down here, you see that? There's beauty. How many of you guys spend time? Never mind. Don't answer that. How many ladies spend time in the beauty parlor? A lot of time involved in our lives, isn't there? A lot of activities, your phone, your social media, friends, even church. You see, this is what makes our lives go round. So the analogy here is that your life is like a wagon wheel. But there's something that happens in the middle of a wagon wheel. Now, these are not wheels that we are familiar with using in our day and age. But in the center, and you'll have this on your cars too, I won't go into that, but it's called a hub. And on that hub rides everything else. And on your car, if the bearings go out in your hub, we got issues. We got issues. But on the old wagon wheels, if something happened to that hub, it was done for. As Christians, God is... Remember sermon? Anybody remember sermon last week? We only preached one of them. <laughs> and it was about God being number one, right? God wants that number one space, and that's the hub of your wheel. And everything else is to revolve around that hub. Now, what happens is that so many times we get involved in life and we forget this admonition of what Jesus says, go and sin no more, and we try to take God away from that hub and we try to make him a spoke. And we try to remove something else. I don't know, friends, sports, time, you name it, food, eating. <laughs> There's a lot of time involved in food prep. Anybody cooks in here? Yeah, I put that on there and Jessica's like, I like that. Because there's a lot involved in that. I like to eat. She likes to cook. And we got a great relationship. So, but what happens is, is when that spoke tries to take the place of that hub and you try to put this, it just doesn't work. And things fall apart. So this whole idea is of the wagon wheel. In order for it to roll straight, things have got to be kept in line. Thus, Jesus' admonition to the man, say, look, you've had a rough time, but now you're well again. Let's start over. Let's start a new chapter. And let's keep things in priority. Let's keep things lined out. God the hub, everything else revolves around that. Not our life around God. 
He's got to be the center. Every reason that we do what we do. It's not, a, it's not enough to just have God in the mix. But he's got to be the purpose. He's got to be the purpose of our life. The gospel message of many today allows people to continue in their former way of life. In the concept of adding Jesus to the list of acquisitions. You know, the gospel message of the apostles changed lives. Changed lives. The message of Jesus to our healed man today was a message of life change. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. First Peter, the first chapter. First Peter chapter 1. Verse number 14 says, As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Everything that you do, be holy. Because it's written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you're addressing as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay upon earth because you know that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life that was inherited from your forefathers, but you were redeemed with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. This is a reminder from Peter for us as Christians to live each day with the appreciation of the sacrifice of Christ, letting that motivate us to walk in a holiness apart from sin. Why? Why do I need to do this? What's the worst that can happen to me? We look at physical problems many times and we say, how can it get any worse? And then Jesus is reminding us today that it can get worse, and our response to that many times is, how can it get worse than this? What's the worst that can happen to me? Well, I'm going to let the writer of Hebrews answer that question. Because his fear, as he wrote the book of Hebrews, was for the believers to not see the work of Jesus as personal to them and that they would fall short in their attention to faithful living. And so he penned the words of Hebrews so that we could see the supremacy of Jesus, but that we would recognize that it was for us. We would recognize it was for us. Notice these words. Listen to them. I know you heard them many times, but Hebrews chapter 3 is where I'm going to start, and I'm going to go through the book. See to it, brothers, verse 12, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. How can it get worse? See to it. Encourage one another daily, he says, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Sin has a way of tripping us up, doesn't it? Causing us to forget where we're at, and, and we can, it can deceive us into thinking that we have a relationship with God when we don't. Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered, laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account he sees it. He knows it. Hebrews 6, 4, It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have been Christians, we'll put it that way, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance because to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. Hebrews 10, 30, we know him who says, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. What's the worst that can happen to me? 
I like the words that he shares with us in the middle of the book. In Hebrews 6, verse 9, even though we speak like this, dear friends, we're confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you helped his people and continue to help them. But we want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Why did I feel called to share that today? It's to remind us. Things are going good. We've been cleansed by the blood of Christ. We've been made well again. But as Jesus said, go and sin no more, lest something worse happens. Jesus spoke on hell more than any other spokesperson for God. He contrasted the eternal punishment and the concept of eternal life for us to get the idea of the opposite spectrums of obedience to God versus hellfire. And as much as we all desire the eternal life, many times we shrink from the idea of eternal punishment. You see, the eternal punishment that Jesus spoke of is not just a natural result of bad choices. It's an actual punishment that's meted out from the wrath of God upon those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to Jesus in Matthew 25, that eternal punishment is the end result of those who simply did not re- obey his request of them, like loving their neighbor as, as ourselves. When did we see you sick or in prison or hungry or thirsty? Just simply loving people the way that God loves us. So when Jesus comes to heal us, and he tells us to go sin no more, I think the message is plain for us, even today. Repentance is in order. A checklist is made for for spiritual growth that demands our attention today. Let's make sure that the Lord is the hub of our lives and that everything else fits neatly around him and fits within his will for us. The invitation is now. Today is the day of salvation. However, whatever your need is today, whether you need to meet the blood of Christ the first time in the watery grave of baptism, say, I'm done. I yield. And give your will to him and rise to walk a new life separate from sin, a life of repentance, a daily repentance, allowing no sin to come in and take root within your heart. If that's your need, I invite you to come. Maybe you say, you know, I'm a Christian, but I need to serve. I need to, t- to plug in, and I need to be a useful servant for God and, and just quit treading water to actually get in and swim for him. We invite you to come. Whatever your need is, let's stand, let's sing together. Touch me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. I praise thee, Lord, for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word and make me pure within. Fill me with fire where once I burned with shame. Grant my desire to magnify thy name. 
Lord, take my life and make it holy thine. Fill my poor heart with thy great love divine. Take all of my will, my passion, self, and pride. I now surrender, Lord, in me abide. Thank you for your attention. Let's be seated for a time. This concludes today's worship service. Thank you for listening. We hope you were encouraged by joining us on Facebook Live. Please message us if you have questions or would like more information. May God bless you and give you His peace.